Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the January 2023 CTSS quiz. I'm actually having a little bit of a hard time saying 2023. It'll probably be several weeks before I get used to it. But nevertheless, it's January. It's 2023. I hope you had a happy and healthy New Year celebration. And let's now celebrate with 10 terrific cases. In this patient with right lower quadrant pain, what's the best diagnosis? Well, if you look at the axial and coronal views, what you see is a mass in the right lower quadrant. The mass has fat density. Now, you could think about fatty tumors, lipomas, liposarcomas, but then you say, where is this mass coming from? Well, it looks like it's coming from the patient's ovary. Now, ovarian masses, malignancies, usually don't contain fat. Occasionally, you can have sarcomas with fat. But most commonly, when you see an ovarian tumor and has fat, it's a dermoid. Now, it's a bit far to the right, which means it's high in position. When the ovary or an ovarian mass is high in position, you have to wonder, perhaps, it's torsed. Uterine cancer, this is not. So the best diagnosis in this case is an ovarian dermoid with possible torsion. And in fact, indeed, there was torsion. Sometimes I have a hard time definitely saying there's torsion present unless I see some free fluid. But when the ovary is far to the left or far to the right, you better at least suggest the patient has a torsion. In this 40-ish year old female, what's the best diagnosis? Well, let's look carefully. Both on the axials and the coronals, we see a complex cystic lesion mainly centered in the body of the pancreas. There's no dilated distal pancreatic duct. And the fact is, mucinous cystic neoplasm, a serous cyst adenoma, and IPMN at least would be the differential diagnosis in part. Metastasis to the uh, pancreas is a consideration but usually they're not cystic, they're solid, and it's usually from something like renal cell carcinoma or melanoma, not typically a GI primary. But I've given you a few helpful things here. One is it's a 40-ish year old female and the lesions in the body of the pancreas. The lesion I think about in the body of the pancreas in a 40-ish year old female with no dilated pancreatic duct with septations like this lesion has is a mucinous cystic neoplasm. Now remember, we always consider mucinous neoplasms to be either malignant or pre-malignant, and all of them will get resected, and this was eventually resected and was an MCN. The most likely diagnosis for this pancreatic mass is, well, both on the axial and coronals, you see a vascular lesion in the head of the pancreas. Typically, vascular pancreatic lesions, I'm always thinking neuroendocrine tumors, and if the patient was hypoglycemic, I'd be thinking about an insulinoma. Serous cyst adenomas usually are cystic. They can have solid components, and at times they can be vascular, but this would be most atypical. You'll also notice in this case is that we do not see the patient's right kidney. Bowel falls posteriorly into the renal fossa. So the patient's had a nephrectomy. Vascular lesions to the pancreas also commonly occur from clear cell renal cell carcinomas. So when I'm missing the kidney, I'm going straight to metastatic renal cell carcinoma to the pancreas, and indeed this was the case. Sometimes with metastatic renal cells, you'll see multiple vascular lesions in the pancreas. One thing to also remember, mets to the pancreas from renal cell often occur 10 or more years following initial detection of the tumor and initial treatment. The least likely diagnosis in this case is, well, what am I looking at? I'm looking at a mass near the AP window. It's kind of necrotic, and that's the only thing I'm seeing. Lymphoma is a possibility. Lymphoma at times can be necrotic, though perhaps you would think I should see more nodal groups, but not always. Lung cancer, I don't see a lung mass, but this could surely be lung cancer. This also could be metastatic disease. Metastatic from renal cell, not uncommon, but also other GU tumors, including bladder and prostate, can give you metastatal adenopathy. 
Now, what about sarcoid? Sarcoid gives you nodes, but only seeing things in the AP window would be atypical. Sarcoid, usually multiple nodal chains are involved. Usually it's the hyla region, and usually with sarcoid, the nodes are not necrotic as in this case. In fact, at the end, this ended up being metastatic prostate cancer, but the least likely diagnosis in my mind would be sarcoidosis. To me, this case is surely a malignancy. The only question is, what malignancy? The most likely diagnosis in this middle-aged female is, well, what am I looking at? I'm looking at a large vascular mass in the region of the right adrenal gland. And yes, you have to consider renal on the axial, and you have to consider liver, but when you look at the coronals, it's surely not kidney. And when you look at the combination of images, it's not going to be liver. It's really arising in the adrenal bed. Now, large adrenal lesions can be metastasis. For melanoma, they're usually solid and not so vascular. Pheochromocytomas can be cystic, and they can be vascular. And that's a possibility, though it's a bit large for pheos, but it's still a thought. Adrenal hemorrhage, this really doesn't look like hemorrhage unless you're trying to convince yourself there's hemorrhage within an area of tumor. On the other hand, a middle-aged female, you got to be thinking about primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. Average age is in the 30s or 40s. They're often very large. They can be very vascular. They can be solid or they can be cystic. And the best diagnosis in this case is a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. The best diagnosis in this case is, well, what am I looking at? I'm looking at pneumatosis and bowel. I think also there's a small pneumoperitoneum and maybe some air in the portal vein. But the most impressive thing to me here is the patient has severe pneumatosis with a little bit of portal venous air. Crohn's disease, you don't see pneumatosis. Perforated small bowel is a consideration, but pneumatosis can be focal. But usually when you see this much pneumatosis, you got to be thinking about ischemic bowel. Volvulus can lead to ischemic bowel. I don't see a twist here. What I see is multiple loops of bowel, extensive pneumatosis, subtle portal venous air, and this is a wonderful example of ischemic bowel. In this patient with sickle cell disease and hematuria, the best diagnosis is... Well, I'm showing you two images, excretory phase, and I'm showing you to them with MIP imaging because I've made the point before that if you use soft tissue windowing, things tend to be obscured when you look at the calyces. With MIP imaging, whether it's the pelvis, the calyces, or the ureter, MIP works very nicely. When you look very carefully, you see all the calyces, so it's not a look of TCC. I don't see any renal calculi. You could see renal calculi through the contrast. I don't see any. And renal infarction, the little bit of the kidneys I see look pretty symmetric, but this would surely not be the window to look for a renal infarct. But when I'm showing you the calyces or the pelvis or the ureters, and I tell you it's sickle cell disease, you better be thinking about the calyces. And if you look carefully, particularly at the left kidney, but also upper pole of right kidney, you see papillary necrosis. We talk about the different appearances of papillary necrosis, but usually that outpouching, the golf and T appearance is what you look for. One of the causes of hematuria in sickle cell disease is papillary necrosis, and this was an excellent example. The most likely diagnosis in this patient with hematuria is, I'm showing you two images. There's infiltration of the right kidney by a mass in part that's vascular, possibly invading the renal vein and IVC with extensive adenopathy. Now, you look at this, you say, okay, it's malignancy. So that's easy, but I'm asking you what's the best malignancy. Lymphoma is typically infiltrating and it's hypovascular, not great. Transitional cell carcinoma can be infiltrative. The image on the right may take you toward TCC and TCC, occasionally involves the renal vein and gives nodes, but the image on the left is just too vascular. I don't like TCC. Papillary renal cell versus clear cell. 
Remember the difference. The average papillary measures under 90 Hounsfield units. The average clear cell measures over 130 Hounsfield units. So when you tell me the patient has an infiltrating tumor that shows extensive vascularity, vascular invasion, and adenopathy, my best thought, as in this case, is a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. The most likely diagnosis on this virtual colonoscopy is, now I know not all of you do virtual colonoscopy, but I showed this case to show you the sigmoid colon. What's going on in the sigmoid colon? Now, you could say it's under distension, but the rest of the colon looks pretty good. Obviously, you'd want to look at supine and prone images. I'm not helping you out in that regard. It could be diverticular disease. There are some diverticuli present, but this thickening is somewhat 360 and circumferential. It doesn't have the look of ischemic bowel, quite frankly, very focal, but this is a good example of infiltration of the sigmoid colon, and this is an adenocarcinoma. Again, with virtual colonoscopy, which we use for screening, you want to look very carefully at the colon. At times, the biggest challenge is when the colon is not distended, but typically supine and prone images make it easy. If it's a real finding, it will show on both sets of images. And this was path proven, an adenocarcinoma of the sigmoid colon. The most likely diagnosis in this febrile patient is, well, I'm giving you soft tissue and lung windows. If you looked only at the lung windows, it looks like wedge-shaped lesions, particularly in the left lung. So I'm thinking about septic emboli or an infarct. When you look at the image on the left, you see filling defects in the pulmonary artery. So what is this? Well, it's not pneumonia, okay? There's something in the pulmonary artery and it looks like an infarct. It's not aortic dissection, the aorta looks good. PE is a thought, maybe I'm not showing you the PE. Maybe I'm showing you just the infarct and you infer there's a PE, but I don't see a PE. But what this patient has, that clot or thrombus in the patient's pulmonary artery is due to pulmonary valve endocarditis with septic emboli. Wedge-shaped perfusion changes in the lungs, also the consolidation in the right lung in this case, which is really infarction of the right lower lung. A wonderful example of septic emboli, lung infarction, and pulmonary valve endocarditis. Well, those are 10 absolutely terrific cases to start the new year. January 2023 hopefully will be the start of a wonderful year for you, for us, and for everyone. I hope you got all those cases correct, but more importantly, as always, I hope you learn from those cases. Have a great day, and see you in February. Be good, everybody. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTS Us YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctsus.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.